So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, tonight's presentation with Dr. Juniper Harrower. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And we are excited to offer tonight's program in support of our annual exhibit of science illustration, The Art of Nature. And this exhibit is enjoying its 33rd year uh, but this time around, for the first year ever, we are presenting the exhibit both on site at the museum with the original works of art and online in the form of a virtual exhibit, um, which has even more artwork featured than the physical show, including the works of tonight's speaker, Dr. Hareworm, um, which are, I guess you can consider them online exclusives for the exhibit. Uh, so I hope you'll be able to visit the museum to enjoy these just like fascinating and gorgeous works of art, but also um, make sure to head over to the exhibit's virtual presence as well. And before I welcome in our speaker, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge as always that the museum is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsan Tribal Band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsan Land Trust. And now I am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, specializing in species and interactions under climate change, Dr. Juniper Harrower uses rigorous science methods and multimedia art practice to investigate human influence on ecological systems while seeking solutions that protect at-risk species and promote environmental justice, all great things. Uh, tonight, we'll be focusing on her investigations into the impacts of climate change on Joshua trees and their critical symbiotic partners. And um, these are two of her pieces that are in the show that um, have to do with those interactions. So welcome, Juniper, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Marissa. Um, I really appreciate it. Nice intro. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, so let me see. I'm going to pull up my talk. Um, so thank you so much. So, um, I, so I'm an artist and an ecologist, and I work with Joshua trees. Um, it's one of my favorite plants, and it's actually where I'm from. So I grew up in Joshua Tree, California, um, which is down in Southern California and uh, the Mojave Desert. It's an incredible place and fell in love with Joshua trees there. I did not expect to be studying them for my dissertation research and to continue doing that work, uh, but it, it just kind of worked out that way. And it was, it was really exciting. And so I've been fortunate to do this work as both a scientist and an artist. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, my whole life I've gone back and forth doing it as a, as a um, science researcher. And more recently, my research process really, um, really focuses on uh, the artworks that I create. So um, I'm gonna share with you the tree that started it all. So this is a Joshua tree actually in my, my parents' backyard. Um, this is where I grew up, um, quite literally. And this is, we, when, when I was a, a small child, this Joshua tree was really, it was, it was quite smaller than this, uh, what you're seeing now. So this is the current tree. So when I started my research, what I had heard was that Joshua trees are actually greatly threatened by the changing climate. Um, and some studies predict that within 100 years, all Joshua trees could be gone from places like Joshua Tree National Park. So from that part of um, their, their distribution. And this was really shocking to me. And I was thinking like, wow, you know, what is it? It's, it's such an, uh, such an iconic tree and it just, you know, what does it mean for us to lose the, the Joshua tree, especially from Joshua tree national park? And what does it, what does it mean for all of the organisms that interact with this tree? Um, and, you know, really it's, we have to think about it in the bigger context too of Joshua trees are just one, one species and we're really in a major um, species extinction event on this planet. So um, I, my interests as a scientist really are to think about things from a multi-species approach. And so with Joshua trees, I wanted to know what was going on with their different species interactions and how might that be important to the Joshua tree under climate change? And also um, just, just 
kind of digging into it and to figure out what's going on a, a little bit better with the Joshua trees. And so Joshua trees have a relationship with a kind of underground fungi. Um, not sure what my next slide is here, so <laughs> let's see. Okay, so Joshua trees have a relationship with an underground, an underground fungi, um, and it's this kind of mycorrhizal fungus that forms an interaction with plant roots. And this fungus grows into the plant roots and then also out through the soils, um, foraging for water and nutrients. And what it's doing is it's passing those wa that water and those nutrients into the plant root in exchange for plant sugars. So we didn't know if Joshua trees actually form these kinds of relationships. Um, many plants do. In fact, it's one of the reasons that plants were able to move out of the oceans millions of years ago um, was by forming these, these symbiotic relationships with these kinds of fungi. It's incredibly fascinating. Plants that form these kinds of relationships now, they tend to grow bigger, stronger, better, faster, they tend to be more resilient against um, pests and pathogens. And um, they can also form these underground networks uh, where plants can send information and nutrients uh, through these networks to each other. So, but we didn't know, do Joshua trees actually form these kinds of relationships and do they matter? Are they important for the Joshua tree? So I went out in my backyard um, to ask, this Joshua tree that I have a close relationship with. Um, I dug up some plant roots and I went into the lab and I found um, that in fact, they do form these kinds of relationships and um, they have all kinds of fungi in their roots. And so I'll show you what you're looking at is a microscopic slide here of Joshua tree roots. Um, so this, this box um, shows you that is a plant root cell. And um, this dark blue material is the fungus inside of a plant root cell, it's filling it. And so when I looked under the microscope, I saw tons of these fungi. So that meant to me that, wow, not only do they form these relationships, it's potentially really important for the Joshua tree. Um, so I really got to dig into further questions to find out um, what kinds of species of fungi could be in those roots um, and what are they actually doing and does it matter and will that change with the changing climate? So that's one part of my work. Another part of my research is that I actually study, um, I study uh, yucca moths, which are these little tiny moths that are Joshua Tree's only pollinator. And this is a really incredibly fascinating relationship. Um, it's a co-evolved relationship that's, that's very old. Uh, it's a very classic relationship when we think about um, co-evolved relationships between, uh, between species. And so this little moth, um, as I said, is Joshua Tree's only pollinator. It's the only way that the flowers set fruits. And so I'll show you a little video here. Um, this, this yucca moth is taking pollen from her mouth parts um, and she's taking them and she's pushing that pollen into the flower. And what's so incredible about this is it's one of the only examples in all of um, plant pollinators of purposeful pollination, where she's actually purposefully pollinating. Um, oftentimes, you know, like a, for example, a bee pollinating, it's an accidental pollination. The bee is visiting the flower for, for other reasons and the flower gets pollinated. But this, this insect is purposefully pollinating. And she does this, um, because next she's going to oviposit, which means lay eggs inside of that pollinated flower. And so what she's done is she's ensured that that flower is going to develop into a fruit and then her developing larva, which are now also inside of that developing fruit, um, will be able to eat some of the, the um, seeds that are forming in that seed pod from the Joshua tree. Um, so it's this really cool relationship. Um, and so her, her developing larva will eat some of the seeds, but then some of the seeds will go on to become the next generation of Joshua trees. So you've got that, that symbiosis right there. So I wanted to know um, when we think about, oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> like I said, the next slide is a surprise. Um, so when we think about uh, after the pollination, the Joshua tree makes those, those seeds and that little seed has to land someplace hospitable. And then it puts down roots and it grows into a little baby Joshua tree. And it's there that it encounters that underground network of mycorrhizal fungi. So here's how these two relationships come together of the pollination and the underground, the underground fungi. 
Um, so to answer these questions of, um, you know, what's going on with these different symbiotic species interaction under climate change. I went out to Joshua Tree National Park um, to collect, uh, to do ecological research. And um, my first round of sampling, I was actually pregnant. Um, so that was quite an adventure. Um, and going out and setting moth traps and collecting soil samples. And then uh, a year plus later, uh, doing some, some future rounds of field work, I got to take my, my little boy with me, um, who was my, ever ready field assistant. <laughs> um, and so what I found from this field work is that across a climate gradient, so that's what you're seeing kind of modeled here is from low to high elevation. Um, I found that Joshua trees uh, really flowered well in certain parts of the uh, certain parts along that elevation gradient. And that there were lots of moths corresponding with that, um, those really happy, healthy flowering trees. There was a, there was a lot of moths there. And at the really low elevation sites and the really high elevation sites, so the really low ones where it was hot and dry, um, there wasn't much flowering. It was very minimal, and there were actually no moths. And so what that what that told me was that. Um, you can see the seed pods here. Um, there was no sexual reproduction happening at those hot and dry uh, locations. And at the cold locations up at the very top, um, I also didn't find any moths. And so there was no sexual reproduction happening at either of those climate extremes in this elevation gradient. So that has some repercussions when we think about um, what could happen as the climate continues to change and where these plants may be able to continue growing. Um, I also found a lot of tree death at the very low elevations where it was getting hot and dry, so um, quite a bit of tree mortality. Um, so for the underground soil fungi, the mycorrhizae, um, I found I sampled across the elevation gradient and with these little squiggly lines, what you're seeing, um, the different colors represent different fungal communities. And so I found along the elevation gradient, different species of fungi um, in my samples um, that actually tracked with the elevation. And so to find out, do those different species of mycorrhizal fungi actually do anything functional with the plants? Um, I planted all many, many baby Joshua trees and I inoculated them with soil fungi. Um, so that's basically putting the different, different species of fungi in with the different plants to see what happens. Um, and I grew them and I sampled them at different time points to see how they're growing, um, how they're absorbing nutrients. And what I found is that these different um, species of fungi represented by the different squiggly colors um, actually do different things. And so um, depending on where, uh, what species they were, where those fungi were coming from, um, the plants were able to, uh, they either grew faster, um, they were bigger, and they were able to absorb different nutrients better. And so that really tells me that um, there's a story there with the relationship between these fungi and um, this little plant's ability to, um, to establish itself as a small seedling. And, and therefore also really important as we think about um, what, what's going to happen with the changing climate, um, thinking about plant restoration projects and also, for example, in Joshua Tree National Park, when we do have big fire events and the park, um, park stewards are going to be planting plants back into those, um, those ruined areas, um, thinking about what kinds of soil fungi could best assist and uh, support these plants in their transplanting would also be really important. So this would be helpful um, to use this information for future studies considering that. So um, I take all of this, this research and I also, um, incorporated into my arts practice. Um, so uh, in these next images, I'm going to share with you some of my experimental painting practice where um, I really dig into um, the not only the my ecological findings, but also um, the experimental process of painting um, this work. And so what I do is I extract seed oil from Joshua tree seeds uh, and I mix that into the paints um, and I use some some different soaps and alcohol uh, as a way to really play with the materi materiality of um, the different paints that I'm using and what I found is that I'm able to then create these really uh, really beautiful underground um, soilscapes that are really reminiscent of what I'm seeing in the field. Uh, it took a lot of experimentation to get these organic processes to evolve um, and 
as well, I also take all of the ecological data and I'm able to translate that into um, different visual visual decisions uh, and aesthetic choices in my paintings. And so um, it's also, there's a level of, um, you know, the, the paintings themselves are also data informed. And so it's a way to think about um, taking all of this information and, and process it, processing it and seeing it in a different way. And so for example, if you were to come and see one of my, um, exhibitions of artworks, the paintings, uh, viewing the paintings, it's almost as if you're moving along the climate gradient um, and experiencing the underground soil fungal relationships. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about these paintings. So um, as you can see, the, the process that I use to um, ex, you know, um, to play with the paint um, using the, the Joshua Tree seed oils and different components. Um, it, it basically creates this fracturing of the paint and I get these really cool organic processes evolving that look like mycorrhizal fungi and what I'm finding in my soil samples. Um, the color decisions are also driven by uh, information and data such as temperature and nutrients. Um, and elevation, and so that those are um, those are things that I use to inform the color the color choices across the different paintings that are representing the different elevations. Um, the tearing that you're seeing is actually tearing through the canvas, and then it, I'm restitching that, and I use fibers from Joshua Tree spines um, to restitch that canvas. And so there's you know um, this this work is also a metaphor and sharing. Um, for some of the, the wounded landscapes that I'm seeing and just the, the, the bigger reality that you know, what we're doing um, to our planet, what we're doing to these ecosystems. And so my process as an artist too, to be um, stitching and caretaking this, um, this, this piece is, is, part of, is part of my process and representative of, of my work as a scientist as well in the way that I am thinking about caretaking our damaged ecosystems. Um, the decisions of the stitching and the number of holes and the, um, the way that I stitch is informed by the different species of fungi that I find um, and these different fungal connections and these, the tension of these symbiotic interactions, which actually can function sometimes um, as a parasite, uh, meaning it takes from the plant, um, and also as a mutualist. It's really a spectrum of positive to, to negative um, um, a relationship along that symbiotic spectrum. And so that also gets communicated in, in the paintings and the work. And so this is a low elevation piece. Um, so it's warmer and there's a lot of different fungal associations happening. So you see a lot of tearing and stitching um, and, and different patterns. And then you'll see in this one, um, it changes as we move up an elevation and the stitching patterns change and the fungal associations um, change. And then this high elevation piece is a little bit different. Um, and again, the, the decisions of colors are changing um, depending on um, fungal structures as well in, in my underground um, soilscapes. And so that helps inform the paintings that I do. Um, so this is, this is a relatively newer piece. And in this work, I also included, I started growing Joshua tree seedlings um, in clear glass chambers. Um, and I wanted it to be, um, you know, really push my, my, collaboration with Joshua trees. And in this, this work, I allowed the Joshua tree roots to uh, inform the decision and the placement of the, the tearing of the fungal associations where they're associating with those underground soilscapes. And so you see, this is an actual, um, this is the, what, what they look like photoshopped out of the soil. Um, and then I use that to drive the decisions in the painting of this elevation piece. And so this one, which actually has the Joshua trees painted into it, um, these are actual Joshua trees from my field research sites um, that that um, you could go into the national park and you could find these Joshua trees and see them. And, you know, um, again, the painting, uh, if I were to translate this for you, it would tell you all about the different um, fungal associations and the nutrients and the temperatures and what's happening in this location for, for these communities. And this is, uh, this is another uh, piece that has a similar story. Um, in this one, I've actually layered the um, the way that I illustrated and painted it on sheets of translucent vellum. And so you can actually uh, see through see through this work. It has five different layers to it. Um, and that, that's another way that I used to think about, you know, these different layers of complexity as I was building the work and also thinking about um, this kind of translucent haunted quality um, really as a way to reflect on, on loss 
uh, as we're, you know, as I'm processing this work and just really reckoning with um, the species loss of something that's that's so important to me and many others. So uh, I'm going to transition that work into another project that's been very near and dear to my heart. Um, so those Joshua trees from these previous paintings actually are from um, a really fun, uh, cheeky little project called Hey J Tree. And this is a, a Joshua tree dating site that I created as a way to really connect people with the different Joshua trees in my field sites and Joshua trees in the national park. Um, so you can actually go to Hey J Tree and you can meet these Joshua trees. Um, and so if we were to pick a Joshua tree, you'll see um, each Joshua tree has uh, all some ecological data shared and um, there's a little, uh, you know, uh, kind of dating profile description written by a guest writer for each tree. And then each tree also has a music video um, by local musicians that work with me to, to create a little music response. And you get to see what the Joshua tree's neighborhood looks like. So you can actually go visit these trees. I include a scavenger hunt. Um, and so you can go out to the park and you could, you could go, meet, go meet this tree. And then finally, um, if you like, you can also send each tree a love letter. So whatever tree really, really spoke to you. And they, they build up little stories this way um, uh, for each oak. And then you can upload going and visiting the tree. Um, each for each of these trees, I've also worked with artists to create um, relief printmaking uh, lino cuts. And so um, with, with, with these, I take them to music festivals and different events and you can make a copy and a print of your favorite tree and take it home and then go find your tree online and, and send it a love letter. And it's been really fun. I've um, at this point made thousands of prints and it's really exciting and people love learning about the Joshua tree and, and send lots of love letters to them. And so it's been a, it's been a really fun process. And I've even worked with children um, at different schools. And in that case, I don't call it a dating site. Um, we call it more of a pin pal site, but the, the kids will come out and we actually go into my field sites in the park and they'll um, illustrate different trees. And we go home and make, or I'm sorry, we go back to the school and make um, stencils. And then they've created big, uh, their own Joshua tree for us out of trees that they found in the park and learned about them and write them little stories. Really fun. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to share with you today is another project um, that that I spent a lot of time with, and this is called a Joshua Tree Love Story. Uh, this is a stop motion animation that I created about my research process in Joshua Tree. Um, originally, I, I just intended to um, kind of bring to life these underground stories with the fungi because they're so com com complicated and just really fascinating. And it's really amazing to, you know, when we're thinking about ecosystems and preservation and species of interest that are important to us, we really, it's a, it's a multi-species affair. And so I really wanted to bring the fungi into this story here. Um, and share, um, you know, with animation, you can really, really share some of um, this beauty. Um, and then with the moths as well and sharing the complex pollination story. But once I got into it, um, I ended up deciding to give it a bigger narrative because I really, it really hit me that, wow, here I am with my, you know, my, my little one, um, this brand new baby, and we're out here and if the Joshua trees um, could be gone from within a hundred years, that's a human lifetime. And that really hits home for me. Um, something I had to sit with quite often while I was out there. And so that became um, a part of the narrative of the animation. And to some degree, it's also a piece about women in science and, you know, what um, what research can look like and the fact that I, I was, um, you know, both um, a pregnant woman out there dragging along a, a ladder in the heat, um, but then also with a little baby. Um, I did have lots of support and help for that. So it was, I was very lucky to be able to do this work. Um, but I'll show you a, um, oh, see, true to life, these characters. <laughs> um, I'll show you a little video, the, the um, trailer, and you'll notice that, so the, the full length feature, which is nine minutes that we're not going to watch today, but um, I do screen that at different places. Um, the, we decided to put it to a, a musical soundtrack, a cello soundtrack, as opposed to having a, um, a strong uh, verbal narrative. Um, so.
That's just a little snapshot of that. Um, and that you can go check out my website and um, see when we screen that if you're interested. I'd be happy to share that with you. Also, if you're an educator, um, I'm, I'm glad to send you the video to share with your classes. And um, I have a whole lesson plan that goes with that too um, for different ages. So um, this was a very fun project, as you can imagine, uh, to do a stop motion. You have to have all kinds of little teeny tiny things and lots of them to be able to, to switch them out. Um, so we had lots of different faces uh, conveying the nuances of emotion and uh, little little tools um, to manipulate in the animation and create these um, create these scenes from the world that I inhabit when I'm in the park. And we also built um, the team of artists I work with. Um, we built uh, these diorama type um, boxes, which were kind of reminiscent of Natural History Museum style um, dioramas. And you know to create these different ecosystems and little little scapes and Joshua Tree at nighttime is a very special one. Um, and then I built a large uh, Joshua Tree blossom that was about maybe four feet across with a yucca moth that then I could act out with the pollination. And so um, you'd be able to see the pollen growing down into the flower and becoming a seed pod. And then we animated the growing of the mycorrhizal fungi um, and the nutrient exchange using clay and paper. And so um, that was all part of the process. So um, yeah, bringing this all together, you know, I, I do my work as both a scientist and an artist. I feel really fortunate um, to, to be able to kind of have a foot in both worlds, but also to be creating and working um, with, with incredibly talented people to um, find an, a new space of communication um, that in, includes both of those fields. Um, so I consider myself just uh, an exploratory researcher uh, that gets to use lots of different tools and methodologies to answer questions, um, and fortunately as an artist and a scientist. And so really we need to, you know, when we're dealing with such big issues um, as climate change and species loss, you know, we really need to be approaching them with as many um, different tools as we can and uh, with the with the broader um, reality of, you know, these are also, these issues completely intersect with social justice and issues of equity. And so this is all really important conversations to be having as we um, develop solutions and move forward. So thank you so much uh, for joining me today and thinking about this work. Um, you can you can check out my website if you'd like to see more of what I do and I share things on Instagram. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Wow, Juniper, oh my gosh. My mouth was either a gape or in a smile during that entire thing. Aww. Everything you do is so delightful. I like don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Marissa. That's really sweet. Appreciate what it. a fascinating um, world you live in and uh, the way that you see the world and, and the things you come up with with how to, how to describe um, these things you're learning. It's, it's amazing. Um, we did have a question come through from Sant, I believe, um, and is curious about another relationship with Joshua Trees that you didn't um, touch upon, and that being the black brush, uh, coleogeny ramos, ramosissima. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that would be, if I could, um, future studies that's the black rush is so special and so it's considered a nurse plant for joshua tree really important um and hi sant thanks for bringing that up <laughs> sant, sant is an amazing artist uh sant Kalasa. um i'm guessing that's who that's who that is uh because you don't hear that name often uh but um so so uh uh black brush is a nurse plant for joshua trees and what happens is the little joshua tree seed falls into um, this nurse plant. And when the baby seedling comes up, the black brush acts as a protection. Um, so that way, when the bunny rabbits are coming along on a hot day looking for some tender, juicy, you know, succulent morsel, when Joshua trees come up, they look like little blades of grass. Um, so they get eaten quite quickly. Uh, but if they land, if they're lucky enough to land in a black brush, they can, you know, they have a better chance of survival. And so it's really interesting to think about, you know, what are the fungal communities that are in that black brush that 
that Joshua Tree's uh, interacting with because fungal communities will change with different plant species. Um, so that would be another really, really interesting thing to explore um, when thinking about it, but yeah. Yeah, so Very then important. does the juniper tree, uh, sorry, juniper, your juniper, does the Joshua Tree um, uh, like kind of take over the black brush then eventually once it gets big yeah. enough? Yeah, so if you go um, with when you're next visiting a, a desert that has Joshua trees, uh, notice you'll notice that a lot of Joshua trees are growing out of clumps of black brush. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. And with the um, the mycorrhizal relationship with those fungi, so multiple microfungi, I guess, um, that you found, was that something that wasn't known before then? And is yeah. that something that that researchers just do? They like if there's a tree that we don't know yet if it has a mycorrhizal relationship, you just go out and you grab some soil and you see. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what what's exciting is that the kind of the genome revolution um, of next generation sequencing really allows allows us to answer these questions because you can't. I mean you can under a microscope to some degree uh, start to identify what species of, of mycorrhizal fungi you're looking at, but it is really, it's hard and it is not accurate fully. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at spores and growth structures and, um, you know, kind of seeing things like I'm communicating in my paintings, but um, really once you, once you, you, so what I do is I take that fungal material and I do the whole DNA extraction process and sequence that DNA and then you get back a whole bunch of information that you have to then parse through and um, with the help of people who are really talented in bioinformatics such as my husband <laughs> I was very <laughs> lucky <laughs> so I didn't need another specialization um, I was able to then um, translate that information and find like wow there are all these different species of fungi in these samples um, across these spaces and so um, you know, it was for me since Joshua Tree was such a, a an iconic and um, kind of like big day. like it's got a lot of cultural weight right now, especially in California. Um, you know, and definitely in Southern California. But um, it was a little bit surprising to me that there was nothing known about its fungi. So, I uh, when I was you know I was a, a fungal enthusiast. I have an incredible mentor in the desert. She's a botanist, Robin Kabali, and she was so excited about fungi and she really just lit a fire um, for me to think about these kinds of soil fungi. And we actually uh, did a book together um, called The Desert Underground. If you'd like to learn more about mycorrhizal fungi, um, she wrote it and I did all of the illustrations. Um, it was really fun to work with her on it. And uh, you can actually buy it at the National Park of Joshua Tree if, you're, if anyone's interested, go there and you can order it online. Um, but um, yeah, I was totally surprised that there was no work uh, on the fungi. And I, when I had heard about Joshua trees and climate change, that was just kind of the question that came to me is, oh, I wonder what's going on with their fungi. And then I realized nobody knows. Dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, associate fungi with kind of like moisture um, yeah. habitats, I suppose. Um, so like initially I find that to be kind of surprising, but then like the more I think about it, the more it kind of makes sense. Like those trees probably need some help, right? Like there must, maybe there's something to that within desert yeah. ecosystems that maybe it's even more important than in others. Right. You have to, you have to establish part of the whole survival game when you're a little, a uh, little tiny seedling is, you know, you've got to, you've got to establish, um, you've got to get your roots down and you've got to grow up quick enough to, to really, um, survive against the, the harsh conditions of the desert and forming those relationships with a symbiotic partner that are, are helpful could be really important for, for different trees. And, in terms um, and of so, the, you know, the thing about fungi. Oh yeah, I was just thinking, so the, in terms of like the success rate of new seedlings, like you were sharing about the different um, elevations. And so it seems like, so one of the issues is that, that the moth, the yucca moth, um, doesn't exist in certain elevations because of temperature, or at least we're not finding it there. Um, so there cannot be new seeds without that pollination. And then there's the rabbits. Um, are there other things that we're noticing about, and then you mentioned tree mortality. So like the trees are just not surviving in the different temperatures okay. as well. Is there, um, are the seedlings doing, you know, 
okay or are there other challenges for yeah, Joshua so Tree successes? In the um, so that's another thing that I looked at. Not only was um, you know looking at the how many dead trees I was seeing around um, is also new seedlings and um, called seedling recruitment, and that was very low in those low elevations and those high elevations. So that again, that does not bode well um, for for you know when you're thinking about. Um, what are referred to as climate envelopes. So that's like where a species distribution is, um, where species can live with, under certain climate conditions. Uh, as the climate changes really quickly, those climate envelopes move. And so you would think, okay, um, you know, perhaps it's moving, shifting up, up slope where it's cooler. Um, and so those plants that used to grow down here, it's getting too hot and dry. So they have to start growing up here. And how are they going to move? You know, the plant can't get up and walk. Um, and so plants either, they either evolve in the areas they, they're living um, to deal with those conditions or their seeds need to get up into higher grounds. And the thing is for um, a plant, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, these species are occurring in multi-species assemblages. And so maybe Joshua trees can make it, but if the yucca moths don't, it's not gonna be very long that you've got, you, you've got the seed, you know, the, the plants are gonna survive because they need to have, um, the seeds need to, need to be set. Mm -hmm. And so really, you know, a lot of, when we think about the, the issues with, with climate change too, it's the, this decoupling of um, species interactions that have, that have evolved over millions of years, um, and things are changing so quickly that we just—it's just—it's hard for these patterns and systems to catch up uh, yeah. in a short amount of time. In a short well, time. and yeah, the the insect symbiont seems so important, and also just like so fragile. Probably even you know without the Joshua tree being stressed in other ways, like who, you know, who knows what other. <laughs> What other factor might affect the yucca moth, which you know, right. then down the line might impact the Joshua trees? Are right. um, is there success with you said that you're working on uh, propagating your own Joshua trees? Mm -hmm. Is there success with um, with like offsite propagation and then planting in these in the higher elevations of like moving that envelope, like you mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, to be to be continued, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so that's and you know um, that's really like an interesting uh, conversation in research communities is um, assisted migration is thinking about you know interventions um, and moving moving organisms of interest um, into different locations and um, and kind of managing those ecosystems. I mean. You know, we have to really contend with the fact that nothing is nothing is wild and untouched, right? Like it's all mm -hmm. this is a highly um, modified planetary system we're living on, and so um, yeah, we have to we have to think about the different ecosystems um, and you know how how we're going to intervene to right. be right. And when you do intervene, you're making a decision. you're making a biased call. Totally. Right to and yeah. and what other impacts down the line are you having? Yep. Um, Sant also mentioned that there's no more ground slots to move yeah. the Joshua trees. <laughs> if only there were ground slots. Right. Yeah, that's link. that's a whole other um, interesting part of the the history and the conversation is that um, it's it's uh, you know potentially that giant ground slots used to move the Joshua tree seeds around, um, and there's some cool studies that that suggest that. Yeah. I'll also share um, for people joining, if you do have something you want to share, um, like verbally, if you'd rather speak uh, rather than write, we have the option to have you do that. And if you do have something you want to say or a question you want to ask, you can just click this little raise hand button and I will know that you would like to be unmuted and I can give you permission. So feel free to play around with that. Um, and I'll just share, I went to Joshua Tree for the first time, like a little over a year ago. And their visitor center had my favorite interpretive signs that I've seen at any national park, I think. And I oh. loved um, what they, uh, how they, they talk about climate change and how they talk about um, how species uh, react to climate change. And you either adapt, you move, or like, yeah, you either like evolve, I guess, move or you die. And then they have the, these different examples of species that have done um, each of those over time and how climate change has happened. Um, but yeah, now it's happening at a much different rate. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, let's see if there, there's lots of just like kudos for you in the chat. Oh, that's um, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if you guys have any questions for, um, for Juniper and uh, I'll ask a question, which is about uh, the algae society, which you didn't talk about today, but I know you are involved with this um, very mysterious sounding secret society, <laughs> the algae society. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about that with us. Sure. Um, uh, do you want to take a question? I see you raised. Oh hand yeah, Le okay. uh, Levi, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, let me give you permission to talk. Levi. And then I'll, so now... I'll fill you in about the algae society. Okay, after. great. <laughs> so yeah, you are um, allowed to speak now, Levi. Ooh, awesome. Um, Hi, Levi. <laughs> hey. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the talk. I was uh, wondering about the the fungal symbionts. Are they unique only to Joshua trees, or do they just happen to work with Joshua trees and other species? Or do we have, do we have any idea? Yeah, so they are not unique to Joshua trees. Thank goodness, um, because that would have made my my work extremely hard because I would have been characterizing and like um, you know naming new species uh, probably would have would have had to had to go through that process. So really, when I found them, they were all um, uh, fungi, uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae, uh, the kind of fungi that associate with the roots, um, and they have lots of different relationships with different plants. So they're generalists. Um, oh, okay, so the 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 types of fungi you found are um, the same ones that you find with other mycorrhizal relationships. They're not unique. To Joshua Tree. To Joshua Tree. Yeah. Is that common um, for it? Like though, you know, if there are mycorrhizal relationships with like a live oak tree, mm -hmm. is it likely that that particular fungi is also the same one that's for Madrone? No. So, so it's interesting. There's a few different kinds of major groups of mycorrhizal fungi. And so there's this kind that's, um, they're called the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And those are the ones that um, they don't make mushrooms. And so they just form these, these, uh, these really cool symbioses with um, inside of the plant root cells. So they grow into the plant root cells um, and they're called arbuscule because you think arbor, ar ar like arbol, like tree. Um, they look like little trees inside of the plant root cells. Um, so those dark blue images I showed you kind of look like flourishing trees. And, um, and so there's all kinds of species that fit into that group of the arbuscular mycorrhizae um, fungi. And those form relationships with lots of different plant species. Um, but then there are some, and so, you know, and not all plant species have all of those different kinds of fungi because those different kinds of fungi, you know, they're their own organism and they, they also have um, constraints of their environment and where they're going to live and grow. And so the kinds of fungi you might find in, in the deserts are going to be different from the kinds of fungi that we would have up here in the Bay Area um, or in Santa Cruz. And so for like oak trees, they form, um, they form symbiotic relationships with different kinds of fungi that are called ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, and those actually will form fruiting bodies, which are mushrooms. Um, and so some plants will form those kinds of fungal relationships and others form um, the, the harder to find and harder to see. You can only see them with a microscope, which is the, the story with Joshua trees. That's fat. Levi, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for thanks for chiming in, Levi. Um, yeah, I had no idea that that was that ectomycorrhizal is specifically for the macro fungi like amanitas. Yeah, um, and then and what was again the name for the the internal root? Yeah, so I think um, arbor ar ar arbol like tree, and so arbuscular. <laughs> it's a hard one. Arbuscular. Love it. Oh. Yeah, it's and those yeah those slides the blue slides oh they're so beautiful I understand why you're like captivated by by this research. Really and that can, it's what? a kind of it's a kind of dye that sticks to the the fungal tissue and so you bleach the roots clear mm -hmm. and then you you steep them in this very very vivid blue and it sticks to the the fungal tissue and so it's this moment when you look under the microscope like am I going to see anything and then it was you know it's beautiful um, structures that are just incredibly complex um, because really you know the more the more um, uh, 
structure you see inside of those um, cells, it's, it's really, it's surface area, right? And so you think about lungs, they look like lungs, they look like trees, there are these forms in nature that really the reason that trees look like trees and have the branching and the leaves, it's, it's surface area for gas exchange. And so it's the same thing with the fungi, you're seeing that same form, um, you know, where it looks like little trees and it's because it makes this really great surface area. So it's, it gets, you know, lots of space um, to have exchange for nutrients and um, different things in the plant roots. Ugh, I just love it all so much. Um, <laughs> but we also have a question that came in through the Q&A. How does alcohol play a part in making the colors? Oh, yeah. So um, alcohol is is uh, was one of those. So I experiment with different uh, materials in the, the my my artwork creating processes. It's just like part of the I really like materiality and playing with that. And so for the Joshua tree paintings, you know, I was playing with the oils from the Joshua tree seeds and I'm really tearing into the canvas and kind of breaking that up and stitching. Um, and the alcohol came in from previous work that I've done uh, where I also was experimenting with, with painting with mushrooms um, and wine. And so when I was living in Argentina, I um, had this other life, <laughs> the part of my story. If you go to my website, you'll see um, some of these paintings. And when I was down there, I was really fascinated by the wine industry and um, just kind of like the deep wine culture and um, in Argentina. And so I started making paintings out of red wine um, and figuring out ways to um, just turn it into an art medium and experimenting with that and doing these really um, kind of complex, almost like watercolor paintings with red wine. Um, but I was also really excited about fungi. And so you can collect these kinds of mushrooms that are called ink cap mushrooms. And they um, turn into a pile of, of ink uh, when you, when you pick them from the ground and put them in a bowl, they'll become black ink. And so I was painting with red wine and black ink um, from organic, you know, that I could, I could collect. Um, and red wine and black ink in Spanish is tinta y tinto. So it was um, the painting process also sounded really fun because it was tinta y tinto. Um, so that just, I saw what, when you paint with alcohol, it does really cool stuff. Um, so that was kind of like why i I experimented. Um, it wasn't drinking alcohol for the Joshua Tree paintings. I actually just use like like you know um, rubbing alcohol because um, it was so strong and it evaporates really quickly and it uh, does a cool reaction with the with the paints and the water on the canvas. And so that was another technique. Is when I would do that, it would create these really amazing organic shapes um, that would have taken me so long to paint by hand, but by like finding these um, chemical and physical processes that I could manipulate the paint with, um, you could really get these things that were like, wow, this is like what I'm seeing both under the microscope, but also under uh, in soil spaces. I just love also like how you use um, materials from your subject for oh, your yeah. pigments and, um, and the gosh, using thread from the Joshua tree too. It's just, it's also wild. I love all the different layers. Like you can just spend hours digging through all of it, it seems. Um, so let's talk algae. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so the Algae Society BioArt Design Lab is a group that um, I, I'm a member of, and it's, uh, it's really fun. It's an international collective of artists and scientists. Um, we are like the core founding group um, are about, I think like six of us. Um, and it's a, a number. Of, so it was really started by Jennifer Parker, who's a, um, she's an art professor at UC Santa Cruz. She's fantastic, uh, was a mentor of mine. And, and then um, some folks in Australia and um, Spain and um, Sweden, um, or she's in Norway now. Um, and, uh, and then a few others in the United States. And we all work with algae as a, um, as a collaborative partner in different ways. Um, and really, I mean, algae are so incredible, especially you think about like blue green algae, just uh, to start with are really like most of the oxygen on this planet comes from algae. Um, algae have complicated relationships with humans, both as, um, you know, major oxygen providers, but also, um, think about human algae interactions and like nutrient runoff from um, agriculture. And, you know, you get these major toxic algae blooms that um, can, can kill people and animals going swimming in rivers. And so that's a, that's another big environmental issue that we see and we deal with. And so we make artwork in response to these, um, to, in response to algae as a, as a non-human life form that we collaborate with. And it's, it's really fun. And just a, another way to think about, um, 
species interactions and just um, our responsibility as um, you know stewards on this planet. And we we do have a show coming up with some really fun. If you go to the Algae Society Bio Art Design Lab, you can see the different kinds of artwork um, ex, um, artwork that's created. And we've got a show that's coming up at the Cameron Art Museum in September. Um, that's going to be a whole bunch of really exciting stuff um, that we're all working on. I'm going to share the link for yep. that. I love um, with algae and fungi, like these are both kind of these underappreciated and sometimes vilified um, species that we share our spaces with. And I love that you are looking for ways to bring positive light to them. Um, and then another thing that I just wanted to chat with you about really quickly is um, I first uh, found out about your work because of the research project that you help steward with students at UC Santa Cruz um, to connect like science illustrators, budding science illustrators with researchers so that they have science to communicate. And, you know, your dating site that you created for Joshua Trees being about communicating in a way that will connect and, and uh, resonate with people and get their attention and create these like positive moments. And that that's like so much of what is important about science is just making it like click with people, you can do it, but if it, you know, if it's not communicated well, then where does it go? Um, so I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about um, the work of your students and maybe, I mean, your students are artists who are partnering up with people who do their own research and then having to communicate that research, but then you have this other um, side of things where you're doing the research yourself and then also have the ability to, to then create the communication tools. Yeah. What's that like? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that question. So I, I direct an art and science um, initiative at UC Santa Cruz through uh, the North Center for, for Natural History. Um, and it's really fun. And so part of that is doing this project where I run an art residency um, connecting artists with um, scientists at UC Santa Cruz to, to create these collaborative works. Um, and it's been really fascinating and a really exciting process and we've learned a lot as we go we've been I think this is its fifth year right now we've got a whole team of artists and scientists working together and what I found is that um, you know when it when it's most exciting and productive is when the there's a lot of collaborative um, action happening and so when the artists can really um, get in there and be um, you know uh, contributing to some of the the research dialogue and thinking about um, how you know not only to communicate the work but just how to think about it differently um, I know in the arts um, there can be some pushback sometimes for thinking about art as just the like a communication form for science and um, or like the PR wing you know of science is like oh let's get an artist to make it so that way people can understand what we're saying I mean artists are like we're more than that and, <laughs> and I totally um, it's absolutely true and I think it's an important correction to say sometimes but I also think like but um, art communication of science is so critical and powerful and amazing and I totally and I and I think it is an and moment as opposed to a but moment you know that it's like no art is an incredible um, powerful absolutely um, important form of research and knowledge seeking and understand you know, meaning making of the world but it's also an incredible way to um, you know not only uh, ask questions but um, to help share and and make information more understandable and to shift culture. And so, you know, part of my work as a scientist, um, I can see, you know, I can only connect with and communicate with certain groups sometimes. And I try and do a lot of outreach, but my work as an artist, oh my gosh, it has reached so many more people. And, um, and so I get, to, I get to see that with working with scientists and artists, just the, the um, not only the net that we cast gets much bigger, um, it's, can you know that communication goes wider people interact with it differently um so you have that hope and potential for culture cultural shifts and also understanding and moments of you know community coming together and talking about and discussing these things but also um sh you know cultural shifts in science potentially um which to me is is really exciting and important to think about how we can kind of de-silo some fields and mm -hmm. um have knowledge exchange across um across many different groups with um 
so much to gain, you know, how can we, how can we think with each other better? Yeah. Basically? Yeah. Those intersections are so important and um, we are all whole humans with mm -hmm. lots of different facets of how we um, perceive the world and go through our lives. And I, I totally agree that um, breaking down those silos is so impactful. And I really appreciate all of the ways that you find to do that. I love your individual Joshua tree um, uh, prints too. The idea that like, it's not this, like this uh, blanket kind of like idea. It's like, no, this is this particular individual tree and appreciating that one particular individual in addition to them all as a whole, all these different ways that we can um, kind of shift shift the narrative of how we talk about these things. I just love it. I um, have a friend who's a somatic psychologist and he he came to help me at one of my screen printing events when we when I was at the Cal Academy of Sciences and I was sharing Joshua Trees and um, hundreds of people were making prints and talking about Joshua Trees and so into it. And he was like, you're changing the world right now. Do you understand like you having people physically make these prints and go through that like they have a relationship now with the Joshua tree and they're going to go home and they're going to, and he's like, you know, he really, he put it into um, psychotherapist <laughs> speak. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm seeing it. Like we, it's, it's a, uh, that kinesthetic process of people moving through and engaging with things. Like I love it. The, um, the um, public art making. Yeah. super fun totally I'm trying to do like all of my work to some degree having some uh, public interface because it's really it's really fun I think it's very meaningful um, and I learn so much and people give me ideas all the time yeah yeah and that just that ability to kind of have an impact on culture is really kind of I think the most um, impactful way of creating positive change like it's one thing to create a report that you send to like some bureaucrat's office it's another thing to like actually have people all around you um, sharing values, um, which happens with that kind of work that you're doing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and those reports, it's interesting because I've, I've seen, um, so I, you know, there's Joshua Trees right now are being considered, I know we almost have to sign off, I'll say this in class, <laughs> Joshua Trees are being considered in California to be listed as endangered. It's a really big deal. Um, and that process has been petitioned by the, the um, um, Center for Biological Diversity, and so they're 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 petitioning the Department of Fish and Wildlife is in that review, um, and the work that I did as a scientist um, actually directly went into you know saying like we need to consider these these species um, for endangered species listing, and it's amazing like wow like that is so important. When we want to talk about protecting. It's like these legal, um, these legal tools actually do, um, you know, and as a scientist, you contribute directly to that, um, the work. And so it's exciting. I'm actually now their first artist in residence for the Center for Biological Diversity. So that was like an announcement. I haven't even got to share that publicly. We're doing PR outreach on that next week, but I'm giving you the little um, insider blurb right now. <laughs> that so is so our, exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. That, sounds, Thank you. that sounds awesome. Yeah. And like, you know, the yucca moth, like, you know, people might not really care. It's there are charismatic species that get our attention that we like, that we do have these campaigns for like, you know, a monarch but butterfly and maybe the yucca moth isn't quite at monarch butterfly status in people's <laughs> hearts and minds yet. But when you can like focus on these symbiotic relationships, it's, you know, all the better. Cause yeah, people love Joshua trees. They're so yeah. um, compelling. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's so wonderful when we are able to um, focus in on how complicated everything is and um, and what all you know goes into making Joshua trees happen. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us about like what you got going on in the future or things that we should be checking out? Um, I would say, so I have a, a whole bunch of exciting Joshua Tree related work actually that I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm going to be producing these next few months in, uh, in response to my residency for the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, and so uh, I would, uh, if you um, sign up on my website or follow on Instagram, um, then I will be announcing all of those things and we're going to be sharing a ton of really exciting work with future exhibitions coming up. Cool. Awesome. And I'll, um, I'll, send out a, an email with links to all of these things um, to everyone who registered tonight. And I'll include a link to your Instagram too. And then I'm also just going to share a link right now. This is um, the link for the exhibit, The Art of Nature. And you can click through to the virtual version where you can see Juniper's work in that. And you can also visit at the museum. We don't have Juniper's work 
it, um, in the physical show this year, but there's lots of other amazing pieces from local artists and, um, uh, and also we are free all May for Santa Cruz Museum Month. So there's never been a better time to come back to the museum. Um, we, we missed you all for the little over a year we had to be closed. So um, we wanted to give you a good reason to, to come on back. Um, so thank you all for attending and thank you so much, Juniper, for sharing your uh, really interesting work and your beautiful images. It was a great talk. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the invite. And I, I love the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and the show, The Art of Nature is always epic. Um, so I definitely recommend people checking it out. And if you can in person, it's such a good party uh, when they throw it next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We Well, we and we did a maker's market at the beginning of May, uh, and we're going to do another one on June 19th, which is Father's Day weekend. Um, and that was a lot of fun. We had loads of people come out and it was kind of like taking our indoor party outside. Um, which was great. So we'll see. and we have another event this weekend with another artist from the show. Kylie Kathleen Smith is going to lead a, a field sketching walk at Poganip, and there's still some space and it's free. So um, I'll include a link in the email as well for um, if you want to register to come on a nice nature walk with us this weekend. And on that note, I think uh, we'll let you all go get dinner. And Juniper, when I end this, uh, you're going to get kicked out too. Uh, okay. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I see all of your wonderful comments. I really appreciate you joining today. And I hope that you reach out and connect with me. Okay. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Good night. Bye.